Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly interview show where top chess players, authors, content creators, and accomplished amateurs discuss their careers and share stories and chess improvement tips. Perpetual Chess is a part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network, and we'd like to give special thanks to our presenting chess education sponsor, Chessable.com. For more information about the show, you can go to perpetualchesspod.com. But without further ado, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We are here with another bonus pod discussing the ongoing Magnus Carlsen slash Hans Niemann controversy. We have two fantastic guests to help us separate the signal from the noise. Uh, Two of the clearest and most rational and incisive thinkers in the chess world, in my mind. First up will be Grandmaster Jonathan Rouse, and he, of course, is an acclaimed author and philosopher. Uh, Jonathan provides kind of a big picture perspective about how we can help avoid uh, biases in our assessment of the um, case so far. Um, and following Jonathan is Dr. David Smerdin. Uh David is an economics professor with a statistical background, uh, and he has worked in cheat detection. He has collaborated with Dr. Kenneth Regan and the chess.com anti-chess uh, anti-cheating team. Um, and he provides great insight on what we can and cannot glean from sort of just looking at uh, statistical models of games and the publicly available ones, as has been in the news recently. Um, so David's got some some great insights on how we can avoid leaping to conclusions uh, based on looking at these games. And David also discusses his other chess-based research a lot. Uh, he's providing just incredible services to the chess community. And it's uh, always a privilege to talk to Dr. Slash Grandmaster Smerdin. Um, so we'll get you to those interviews very shortly. Uh, the timestamps of topics discussed and inter- and uh, time of guest is in the show description. Um, but I highly recommend you guys listen to both interviews. I found them both to be quite insightful. Um, I did want to read Magnus Carlsen's statement. That's been the major news event since uh, I last joined you guys in our prior bonus podcast. Um, A lot of you probably saw it, but just to be sure, this will just take a couple minutes and obviously feel free to skip ahead if you've already heard it. Here is what Magnus wrote. Dear Chess World, at the 2022 Sinkfield Cup, I made the unprecedented professional decision to withdraw from the tournament after my round three game against Hans Niemann. A week later, during the Champions Chess Tour, I resigned against Hans Niemann after playing only one move. I know that my actions have frustrated many in the chess community. I'm frustrated. I want to play chess. I want to continue to play chess at the highest level in the best events. I believe that cheating in chess is a big deal and an existential threat to the game. I also believe that chess organizers and all those who care about the sanctity of the game we love should seriously consider increasing security measures and methods of cheat detection for over-the-board chess. When Neiman was invited last minute to the 2022 Sinkfield Cup, I strongly considered withdrawing prior to the event. I ultimately chose to play. I believe that Neiman has cheated more and more recently than he has publicly admitted. His over-the-board progress has been unusual and throughout our game in the Sinkfield Cup, I had the impression that he wasn't tense or even fully concentrating on the game in critical positions while outplaying me as black in a way I think only a handful of players can do. This game contributed to changing my perspective. We must do something about cheating and for my part going forward. I don't want to play against people that have cheated repeatedly in the past because I don't know what they're capable of doing in the future. There is more that I would like to say. Unfortunately, at this time, I'm limited in what I can say without explicit permission from Neiman to speak openly. So far, I've only been been able to speak with my actions, and those actions have stated clearly that I'm not willing to play chess with Neiman. I hope that the truth on this matter comes out, whatever it may be. Sincerely, Magnus Carlsen, world chess champion. So there you have it. That's really the major news event of the past week. Obviously, there's lots to dissect from that. Um, I discuss it particularly in my conversation with uh, Jonathan Rousen. Um, So we'll get you to that interview. Before we go, just want to thank our sponsors, Chessable and Aim Chess. Be sure to check them out if you are looking to improve your game and to remind you to subscribe to the Perpetual Chess Link Fest if you would like a free email delivered to you every Friday covering the top stories of the in the chess news, as well as some book reviews and uh, blog posts about chess improvement and anything I come across in the prior week that I think is worth sharing. So let um, 
Let's get you to the interviews. I will catch you all in them. And thanks for listening. Perpetual Chess is proud to be brought to you in part by our presenting chess education sponsors, Chessable.com. Of course, Chessable uses space repetition to help you learn opening sequences, tactical patterns, um, specific end games, whatever it may be that you need to work on on your game. Uh, some of their latest courses include Understanding Chess Openings Part 3 by none other than Big Vladdy, former world champion, Grandmaster Vladimir Kramnik, sharing his lifetime of expertise on uh, how to respond to various E4 possibilities. So be sure to check that out. And they have a, a free preview for Chessable Pro members. So please just remember to make it part of your routine to go to chessable.com and check out uh, all of their new offerings, which are available both for free and for purchase. And we are here with a returning guest to the show, someone I am always honored to speak with. He is the three-time British champion, a renowned author and philosopher. He is the director at Perspectiva, a London-based op- um, organization looking to solve some of the world's major problems. Uh, welcome back to the show, Grandmaster Jonathan Rousen. Lovely to be here again. Good to, good to speak with you. Yeah, I've... I always enjoy hearing your perspective, as I've said many times, always enjoy uh, reading your writing. And you have been discussing this ongoing drama a bit on Twitter, Jonathan, but I was uh, quite honored when you offered to come share a few thoughts. So why don't we start big picture, Jonathan? Obviously, the big news of this week so far on Wednesday morning, my time, Wednesday afternoon, UK time is uh, Magnus's statement this week. But how have you assessed uh, this entire controversy and uh, the chess world's reaction to it? Well, I mean, I feel almost like we should back up. I feel like it's so heated and uh, so exciting in one level and troubling in another and contentious and fraught in its own way. And uh, there's lots of big issues inside the scandal that are worth sort of bringing to to the fore. But I suppose I'd want to start at a human level, just thinking for a second. I remember when... uh, some years ago, uh, Meghan, Meghan Markle got married to, to what was then Prince Harry, and the, the Archbishop of Canterbury was asked you know, what he'll be focusing on that day, and he's the one doing the actual wedding. And he said, look, there's going to be millions of people watching and all sorts of people showing up and all sorts of ceremonies, and, but my job is to remember that two people are getting married. So to, to sort of analogize here a little bit, I would say just worth thinking about what life is like at the moment for Hans Nyman and Magnus Carlsen, um, to take a moment uh, to get into their respective worlds. I mean, I don't know Hans very well, but I have, based on his interview, based on what it, interviews, based on what he's described, based on what people know about him, he'll obviously be in a challenging situation now. Um, he is suddenly very public uh, with mm, a way he wouldn't have anticipated and for reasons he wouldn't have hoped for. Um, his reputation is um, in, in a certain amount of trouble, jeopardy. Um, he, I don't know how isolated he is. I don't know how much support he has, friends, family. Uh, he's spoken about being on the road and living out of a suitcase. I don't know what his world is like and how he is contending with this. For Magnus, obviously a very different scenario, a great deal of support, a great deal of power in his grasp, his confidence in himself, his his prior achievements, the people around him, Um, his existing very good reputation in the world, taking a little bit of a tremor, tumble in recent weeks. But nonetheless, I wonder if he regrets what he's done. I wonder if he feels that he has information that meets such that he has no doubt that he's done the right thing, or I wonder if he's actually doubting if he's done the right thing. I wonder what kind of advice he's receiving. So I think of these two people, first of all, and try and see them as human beings, I suppose. And then, then I ask myself, how should we think about this? And one of the first questions we should ask ourselves on almost any matter before you ask what is true is to check in with your own motivation and ask, what do I want to be true, (laughs) right? Because uh, part of the problem here is a lot of people haven't asked that question before they started thinking about it. What do they want to be true? Now, I can think I can say at a personal level, in all honesty, I don't have a great deal of skin in the game here. I I don't very much want it to be true that 
Nyman is a cheater and he did cheat in the game against Magnus and therefore Magnus did the right thing. Nor do I feel strongly motivated to say Nyman is innocent. He's confessed the prior misgivings. Everyone makes mistakes. He's playing well. His reputation's been trashed. Magnus has done something unforgivable. Um, I don't want either of those outcomes particularly. Um, insofar as I have a motivation here, I do want uh the cheating the perceived cheating challenge and the real cheating challenge and they're often the same thing um to not take the wind out of the sails of the chess boom the extraordinary magnificent sense that chess is now cool growing booming beautiful and all the rest of it i don't want this this cheating scandal which is turning into a bit of a saga to mm-hmm. um to take the wind out of that that sail um so i'm motivated to sort of make sense of it as well as possible without pointing too many fingers um and try to get to the bottom of it in a way that we can think about it such that we can clarify what we actually know and what we merely have reason to believe and and, and then then get our own sense which will vary across people about how likely things are to be true um and in that respect um I'm not sure the best place to start, but but the statement is interesting in lots of ways. Um, but I think it really helps to cut through analytically if you ask yourself what exactly is at stake here. What are they what, before you get into looking at Nyman's games with chess analysis engines and seeing the percentage matches to try and gauge whether he may or may not have been cheating at some point in the past. Before you get into somewhat lewd and ridiculous speculations about anal beads or other forms of implants ask yourself what are the contentious issues at stake so the first distinction i'd make is between three different kinds of claim here the first is has hans nyman cheated at all ever and the answer is quite an easy one right because he confessed as much he said he has when he was younger when he was 12 and when he was 16 He's done it twice. It was always online. They weren't in particularly important tournaments. He regrets it dearly. It happened only then. And since then, he's a reformed character. He's been working extremely hard on his chest. It's gotten very good. And he's really sad that his idol, Magnus Carlsen, has trashed his reputation without good reason. That's his main version of events. But we can certainly say we know for a fact that Nyman in the past has cheated at least twice. And uh, the question then, the second question is, well, Magnus has said, and he said this in a statement, that he believes he has cheated more and more recently than he has publicly admitted. Those are the exact words. More and more recently than he has publicly admitted. Now, this is a real bone of contention because um, Magnus believes it. Now, he can believe that on many bases. Uh, it could be his own grandmasterly intuition. His, his very acute reading of opponents, his strong understanding of the game and what's possible for a human mind to grasp and not grasp. It could also be reinforced by extra data he has access to through his recent um, particular close partnership with chess.com that seems to be uh, becoming a sort of merge with the Magnus Group. He may have extra information there that makes it, makes it beyond reasonable doubt that his opponent has been cheating in the past. But even if that's the case, right, and the second question is, has he been cheating more or more recently? Even if that's true, it does not follow that the real issue in contention, did he cheat in the -the over-the-board game at the Sun Club Cup? It doesn't follow that that would be true, right? So we've got to keep these three things apart. Has he cheated in the past? Yes, we know that. Uh, Has he cheated more and more often than he's admitted? I would say that's a moot point. I think there, because he's cheated in the past, while you still need to look for evidence and you still need to presume innocence, there is some prior probability. And and those who understand statistics, and I don't, by the way, I I only understand it well enough to sound like I understand it, is um, there's something called Bayesian theorem, which is to do with how you adjust your sense of how likely something is based on new information. So if Hans hadn't cheated in the past, there'd be a certain probability that he was was cheating. But because he's confessed to cheating, that would just increase slightly your your sense that he might have cheated since then. And it might also have made it slightly less likely that you'll believe him and take him at face value. 
And I think that's legitimate. I think it's reasonable to doubt his assessment of his own cheating. He may well be understating it, but we don't know. We can merely say it's possible that he's cheated more than he said he has. And then with that in mind, you can look at all of these games he's played. You can use all of the analytical engines you want. And you can try and gauge how likely it is that he's cheated more and more often than he's admitted. And there, there's an there's, there's open game on that at the moment on the internet. You can see YouTube videos and Twitter threads, people trying to show that it's very likely some believe that he's cheated more and more often. But again, short of definitive proof. And there's a, right. whole, there's a whole subculture there of statistical analysis and what it means to gauge cheating and what's reasonable and what did, what did Reagan say versus what other people have said. Um, but to be honest, I want to keep clear-sighted about the third point, which is, did he well, cheat? Well, yeah, did he cheat in that actual game? Did, that, did the game that led Magnus to withdraw, do we have any reason to believe he cheated in that game? And I think there, honestly, Magnus is on pretty thin ground. I, mm-hmm. I don't think, even if you have some prior reason to suspect cheating in offline events, based on the fact that he's admitted it and that maybe there's some data making it even clearer that he's done that, it still doesn't follow unless you can suggest a viable mechanism or catch him in the act. There's any reason to believe he won that game unfairly. And I say that, by the way, you know, as a grandmaster with you know, not the judgment of Magnus, I, I accept, but still quite a high level of chess judgment that can say, while that game was a high quality performance by Black, there was nothing in it that suggested extraordinary degrees of prowess or insight beyond what a young, talented grandmaster could find. So that's how I see it in outline. I see there's a real open question about Nyman's version of his own cheating. And there is a there is a sort of hypothesis there to be checked against games and against other people's intuitions. Um, but there's a, there's also a question of if the, if it is the case that Magnus didn't have a good reason to believe he was cheating in their own particular game, then he's done something pretty outrageous. He has projected onto one person, one relatively relatively disempowered person, the entire cheating problem of the chess world and forced it onto Nyman's shoulders. He, in effect, this is known as scapegoating. Um, now. We don't know if that's the case um, because because it might turn out yet that Nyman cheated in that game. But in all honesty, what is the basis for that claim? At the moment, all we've got from the statement is that Magnus felt his body language was a bit surprising for someone with a winning position. I forget the exact line. Let me just see it here. Um, I had the impression that he wasn't tense or even fully concentrating on the game in critical positions while outplaying me as black in a way I think only a handful of players can do. This game contributed to changing my perspective. To be honest, that would not stack up in a court of law, not even close. Um, And therefore, I feel there's something a bit troubling at the heart of this, um, which is whatever you think of someone's prior behavior, the presumption of innocence is really precious. It's almost as precious in fact, it's even more precious than the desire to have a chess world free of cheating. So I see those two things in tension uh, as well. It's also part of the story and why it's so heated. Anyway, that's a lot, but that's roughly how I see things at the moment. Yeah, I think that's a great overview. Thanks for breaking it down in a way where people can sort of get to the root of hopefully their biases. But I did want to draw one distinction, Jonathan, because I think where a lot of people are getting uh, sort of stuck in the mud is a subset between what you laid out as question number two and question number three, which is uh, did um, did Hans cheat over the board prior to Sinkfield Cup? Not just did he cheat uh, more than he admitted, but did he cheat over the board? Um, Do you think because as you alluded to, Hans Hans only admitted to cheating twice, and Magnus suggests he cheated more. But w- one other thing people should keep in mind is Chess.com and their statement strongly suggested that he's cheated more recently, presumably online, although they haven't followed up that statement. Um, so I think there's reason there's uh, reasonable grounds to think that Hans may not have told the full truth. 
But but more importantly, Jonathan, do you think there that it is an important distinction whether he cheated online? Say it wasn't at the Sinkfield Cup, but some of these games that are being dragged out hypothetically, um, would that uh, make Magnus's reaction more justifiable? Well, I think you, we've got to be careful about what it means to to know someone who's cheated. This is um, a somewhat philosophical point, but there is a world of difference between um, balance of probability and making a judgment and actually knowing it for sure, you know, having real justified true belief, confident knowledge. I think they're different things. Now, I think if you analyze Nyman's over the board games, as some have, and you find, for example, 100% correlations between his games and the best engines recommended best move, and you find that a lot, or a lot more than some other statistical norm and suggest you should, it's enough to at least raise the eyebrow. You know, it's enough to at least say what is going on here. And then when you add that on with prior cheating record, again, you're beginning to feel this looks um, suspicious, but it's only suspicious. It's not yet damning proof, damning evidence. So I, I, I have to hold open the possibility that that does indicate a level of cheating over the board, but I haven't yet analyzed it in depth. I haven't seen enough sort of uh, respected statisticians or chess cheating people saying it really does look very unlikely that a young promising player um, could play this, this to this degree of accuracy this often. Um, and therefore, it begs the question of whether he had assistance, um, digital assistance of some kind. Um, so you're, to your question, I think if Magnus was believed, it was very likely, almost to the point of certain, that Nyman had cheated over the board before the Seinfeld Cup and that he hadn't been caught for it, it begs the question of why he played at all. Right. Um, because I know there was some suspicion. I believe Magnus expressed concern and he said he had serious doubts about playing. I believe uh, Nepo also made comments to that effect. Um, and I know that, you know, when the story broke, I don't quite know what Hikaru has said since then, but initially Nakamura said a few things about, um, you know, Hans's prior record and so forth. Um, and then I think Caruana has analyzed a couple of his games and suggested that some of it was either ingenious or something else. So it's tricky because, um, you know, a lot depends on your your temperament and your sort of your I don't know your your ethical disposition because some people see the story and they're very excited about catching the cheater right some some right. are some are very motivated by once a cheater always a cheater he's cheated he's a cheater and they all and on they go and there and there's a lot of confirmation bias and seeing look at this game where he played brilliantly he can't play that brilliantly. I even had someone on Twitter today saying he beat Magnus in the end game and nobody does that. He must have been true, right? <laughs> right? Now that's, um, all of this is bogus, right? Um, however, there is a higher order of analysis that says, well, he has cheated in the past. It is possible to cheat. It is possible to cheat in a way that people haven't yet detected or figured out. Although that can drive you crazy after a while, because of course you need to have some idea of how it's done, even if, you know, even if the mind boggles to a certain extent. Um, so, and other people, so other people don't feel that so much. They don't feel you got to catch the cheater. They feel poor young guy who has ambition, had a few weak moments, has since aspired to be a great player, inspired by people like Magnus, working really hard in a dedicated way. Maybe he's also a relatively unique talent. You know, maybe he really is very, very good and not just good. But he's of the computer generation where maybe his mimicking of computer playing is not that surprising, arguably. And this is a moot point where I need to look at it more. But it is conceivable that some players might match computer suggestions more than others. Um, and it wouldn't always translate to them being a stronger player or having better results. Because from what I understand it, you know, on the one hand, you can have these string of 100% matches. But then you have a, a mediocre result or a loss that's unexpected or a, a bad move. And so it, it doesn't always add up to a very clear picture, either of cheating or not cheating. Um, and that's why we're in this pickle, this predicament, because it, it it's going to be very hard to get to the bottom of it. 
Yeah. And um, I interviewed uh, Dr. David Smeridan, who does have a statistical background, uh, and it'll be appearing on this this same show. And, he, you know, he points out that there's very little we know about the chess-based algorithm, how it works. Um, as I woke up here Wednesday morning, I was also reading some discussion um, online uh, about it may call an engine match based on how many engines have been run against a certain position. So um, like you, Jonathan, I don't know what happened with Hans, um, but to use this brand new tool that we have no familiarity with that they explicitly say should not be used as a way to identify cheaters, as uh, Dr. Smerden points out in our interview, um, it's certainly um, yeah, it's yeah. not a smoking gun. It's not a smoking gun. There, there's a problem with any sort of new technology where um, it, apparently this is brand new and it solves every problem um, and, it, and, it, and it gives you the answer you need. But unless you've had a several years of doing it, unless you understand the underlying algorithm, you are, um, there is this term in the field called epistemic debt or, or intellectual debt. It's a way of saying that the people who create the, the, the algorithms don't always even understand the basis on which they're coming to their judgment. Um, that's a bit lateral based on um, the, the current Nyman Carlson issue. But it gets to this point of what do you want to be true? Because if you really want one thing to be true, you can probably convince yourself of it based on these devices. And we, we haven't had enough years and enough practice to gauge which of these really do give you reasonable grounds for one judgment or the other yeah and as you said meanwhile we have a 19 year old kid twisting yeah. in the wind that looks like he might be blacklisted i mean it's uh i was saying to to david that it, to me it seems like the base case at this point i mean magnus says maybe he'll come forth with more evidence he certainly suggests you know as he's as you you alluded to when reading his statement when he says um this game contributed to changing my perspective. Um, you know, it's clear that he's tiptoeing in the statement. It's very carefully worded in terms of what he will and will not say. Mm -hmm. But it seems clear to me that he thinks Hans cheated at that, like in that game, even though, as you say, looking at it from the outside, it seems very low probability. Um, but barring some sort of video evidence or even strong suggestions it seems to me that this is not super likely to be resolved tidily i think that's right and, and that's part of the problem here um as i was preparing for this conversation i remembered i'm from scotland and we and in scots law we have something quite unusual um when there's a sort of murder case or something we have a um a not a not guilty, guilty verdict, as everyone else has. We have those two verdicts. But we also have a third verdict, which is called not proven. And when the jury gives a not proven verdict, what it effectively means is that they think the person is probably guilty, but there's insufficient evidence to prove it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, in other words, they haven't been presented with enough energy, evidence to convict, but nonetheless, their judgment, and therefore the person can't be put in prison or anything like that, but um, their judgment is that they probably did it. Now, that, that this is not a verdict that people like. It's considered a very unfortunate feature of the law in many ways. It's there for various historical reasons. But similarly with the chess world, um, you can get into a position now of this sort of looming atmosphere of suspicion. And um, no one wants that, right? It affects, it undermines everything. Um, as I've said, as I've said in a, another recent interview, you know, in the case where someone lets you down and lies to you, there's a line that says, what hurts me is not that you lied to me, but that I can no longer trust you. And, and in the same way, the problem with cheating in the chess world is that if it's ever present as this possible threat, the whole atmosphere is undermined, contaminated, diminished. And we don't want that, right? We want to play safe in the knowledge that um, no one's cheating. The question is, though, how how much do you need to feel that way? Like what, how, how safe is safe in that sense? And in this context, if you're doing electronic screening and you have a time delay, let's say, I know that there's question marks over exactly what applied in the case of this particular game. But if you're doing reasonable things to prevent cheating at a higher level, 
um, that ought to be enough. You probably the, trying to get rid of it further will just undermine undermine the effort. Um, I'll give you a parallel there, if you like, like the London Underground, where I live in London, you know, it's an open system. And if you're having a, a major event in London, whether Olympics or whatever else, um, you really can't control who goes in and out of that system. And if you want to, you can have police at every single station checking passports and documents before people go under. And again, when they emerge, but it completely compromises the entire spirit of the city and, and what's possible. So in the same way with the chess world, if you want to, yeah, you can strip naked and be x-rayed and, you know, put in a glass chamber and, you know, the delay is, you know, a whole week instead until the game's public or whatever. If you want to go crazy, you can, but then it's not worth it, right? So you have to get to the point where what's enough to remove reasonable doubt? Um, and I think we're quite close to that already, which is why I don't think we should get too carried away about this. Like, um you know, chess players, as you know, are trained to wonder how the opponent's going to try and kill them, right? right. <laughs> this is what we do, this is who we are at some level. We are very sensitive to the opponent's intentions. And that makes this a little bit tragic because there is a flip from natural, you know, natural vigilance to make sure that your position's safe and that your opponent's plans are under control to a kind of heightened vigilance or hypervigilance where you think they might be getting external help to help them see things that they, that you can't see. Um, and that can give rise to more general paranoia and an atmosphere around the game where all the excitement I was speaking about earlier is, is diminished. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and, you know, more security, some more security to me is not a bad thing, but I do think that, especially at these elite tournaments uh, like Sinkfield Cup with so many people watching, um, despite all the like hypothetical, um, you know, body implants and, uh, mm. and uh, you know, deeply embedded earpieces that people are linking to online now, to me, it just seems improbable that someone's going to risk their career um, at, at that stage. Now, I do think that at the even um, medium professional to club level, it's cheating probably has been um, under, uh, they haven't been vigilant enough in terms of enforcing it. So maybe that'll be a small good that comes out of this because the the, the incentives are different when you're not an elite professional. It's true. Um, yeah, it's true. I mean, to give you it's an interesting uh, counter or example, I... Uh, I'm a relatively inactive grandmaster, but I recently started playing again after about five years of not playing at all. And prior to that, I didn't play very much. I started playing in the tournament I chose to play was because it was in London, my home city, and it was only over four and a half days. Um, but that was like a, a GM norm tournament, a closed event, uh, not a very high category. So I think average rating was 24, 30 or something like that. Um, and I mention it because the ruling on computer cheating was in effect, you must hand in your phone uh, before the game starts. And if you're caught with an ele electronic device on you of any kind, uh, it's an immediate forfeit without question. Um, and they also did a random electronic scanning of I think two players before every game and they would you know, they'd change that every game. And that was enough for me personally. Yeah. I felt like I, I felt scared a couple of times when I came in for the game a bit late and I was focused on getting to the board and I realized my phone's still in my pocket. And, you know, if I, if I didn't deal with that, then two moves later, I could lose the game. Um, so there is a kind of change in the culture where it's like, okay, you have to now, just as you go to an airport, okay, guys, you have to take your belts off at security and you have to put your bags with a checker and you get used to it. In the same way, I think above a certain level of play where there's something at stake that's meaningful, whether it's, I don't know, title norms or some prize money, um, then I think some basic measures like this will just become normal. Uh, but it's sad, right? That a random club game, in a, I don't know. <laughs> it's sad to think that you have to have that level of vigilance. Um, but maybe you just do. Maybe that's just the way it is. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, as an aside, Jonathan, so is this comeback going to continue? Well, I don't think I'm a threat to Magnus, put it that way. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I... I think, yeah, I think I want chess back in my life a little bit. I find it 
energizing. I notice myself feeling a bit more like myself when chess is at least there to some extent. Um, I In the first tournament back, I played okay, but not brilliantly. I was a bit, as we say in Scotland, feared at a certain few moments. I took a couple of draws before time scrambles when I might previously have rolled the dice because I was feeling particularly averse to losing. Um, and it's, it's weird not playing for so many years because you don't really have an opening repertoire anymore. And um, a lot of people said you should prepare, but it's not really preparing. It's kind of re-familiarizing yourself with the whole world. In fact, it's funny, it's a, you know, it's a strange segue, but one of the curious lines about Magnus' uh, statement is his very first one, dear chess world, he says. And I thought that was quite amusing because when you're out of the chess world, you don't realize the extent to which it is a world. Sorry, when you're in the chess world, you don't always realize the extent to which it is a world. You just see it as kind of the way things are, it's your life. But when you step outside of it and you sort of look, peer into it and you see people talking about these games and these scandals and you know this new technology and this new opening DVD and this this new chessable course and you know all of the stuff that's going on, uh, you think like that world is not mine, you know, but it is a whole kind of world with all of these different associations in it and these kind of tentacles that reach out from that world. Um, and so it was good to be out of it for a while. It allowed me to build the rest of my life, my you know, professionally and family wise and so forth. Um, and now I just feel things are stable enough that I, 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 I think I want, I want to be worthy of the Grand Master title, I suppose. Um, but but my ambition maybe doesn't stretch much beyond that. I just want to play a few good games and um, enjoy being part of the world again. Well, we're, I'm glad to hear that. And that sounds like a, a healthy approach, given all of uh, your other responsibilities. Yeah, it's, um, it's very much leisure. It's like a, it's very much sort of leisure, amateur love now. Um, anyway, yeah. Yeah. Um, and back to the Neiman Carlson story, I, the, the last sort of major um, conversation point I had in mind, Jonathan, and thanks again for doing this, was you had uh, said something on Twitter reflecting on how uh, this um, this controversy is sort of bringing forth a lot of behavioral biases from people. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to hear you uh, point out a few examples because I, I, I find I'm fighting myself. You know, I, I'm like on a on a I feel like I'm on like a boat in a rainstorm you know, falling from one side to the other as I try to assess the evidence and also try not to like publicly draw conclusions. <laughs> I mean, I think the main thing, as you say, is is the human element, making mm. sure that that we keep in keep in mind that these are people involved and that, uh, you know, whatever your personal opinion of something, generally people deserve the benefit of the doubt. But anyway, I'd love to hear you discuss behavioral biases as it relates to this story. Yeah, well, I mean, you see this if you try and get into any kind of conversation online. Um, people will, there's a lot of what's sometimes called whataboutery going on. You know, they'll point to one particular game or one particular example and say, what about this? What about that? What about the fact that, you know, Caruana said this? What about the fact Nakamura said that? What about the fact that, and, it's, and it goes on like this. Um, and, it, and the way that bias works is it sort of loads perception. So it sort of orients you towards some things and away from others. And I think this is a very good, the reason this is an intriguing story and the reason it's caught the attention of the whole world is that people can feel that when trying to make sense of this, you're also trying to make sense of a whole host of other features that are more subtle, but are sort of embedded in it. So that's like the influence of technology in our lives in general. The whole idea of building a reputation in, in a, an online, in a world that's where culture is mostly in social media and online. Um, and also trying to make sense of where chess fits into the world now and now that it's sort of a bit more mainstream and uh works so well with the digital medium um insofar as you want me to speak about biases i mean examples would be um those who support nyman probably don't think enough about the reason why the top players would be suspicious of him um and also why they wouldn't take for, take as given, take as self as sort of straightforward his admission of his prior cheating being the extent of it. Um, and people on the other side, on Magnus's side, I think are often a bit blinkered by, first of all, their kind of love of Magnus and the, the sense of him being the, the king that can do no wrong, um, but also somehow feeling that he was, that he was, 
they, they'll sort of downplay the fact that actually there isn't really any credible story of how this cheating took place. And also, it is entirely possible for uh, a young climbing grandmaster to beat a world champion having an off day, even with black. Um, another thing that comes to mind is that uh, of all the tweets on this matter, there was a relatively understated one from Gatha Kamsky, no less. And Kamsky just pointed out that, I forget the date, I think it was between 1989 and 1990, if I remember rightly, um, his rating went up from 2345 to 2650, climbed <laughs> about 300 rating points in one year. And that was sort of comparable in some sense to what Nyman's done in recent months and years. Um, so there's nothing about the Nyman story that means cheating is um, self-evidently true. At the same time, there's enough going on that there's reason to believe uh, that Magnus sort of, there's a basis for what he's done. It doesn't follow that he's right to have done what he's done. I personally think he's not. My, my own view is that he made a mistake, um, that he, he is, there's a sort of weird, weird mixture of things going on whereby Magnus as sort of leader of the chess world, symbolic leader of the chess world, let's say, recognizes a problem for the chess world, this general phenomenon of cheating. And he sees that it's a really big deal and it can undermine everything. Um, and then something happens where it comes very proximate to him and it directly affects his interests. And he feels in, involved in it and also some some extent responsible for it. And I think he kind of put two and two together and got five here. I think he thought this is the moment to make an issue out of cheating. But he's never been clear as to whether what he's really saying is I don't like playing against Nyman because he's cheated in the past uh, and I don't like quote unquote cheaters. By the way, that term calling someone a cheater is obviously loaded and pejorative because it assumes that somehow once a cheater, always a cheater. And a lot of people are using that language. Whereas I think those who are a bit more sympathetic to Nyman don't use the word cheater so much. They speak about particular instances of cheating and, and try to limit, limit it to that rather than make it a sort of indelible character uh, feature. Um, but yeah, I think what happened with Magnus is that somehow he really wants to deal with the cheating problem. And, he, and through this game that he lost, he used that as the basis to make the general point. And then it was to some extent reinforced by Nyman's prior admission of cheating, but it's got very murky as to what exactly the nature of the objection is. Because I think what's probably true um, is that Nyman did not cheat in the Seinfeld Cup game. Um, he did cheat uh, when he was younger, and I think it's also at least at least possible. And 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 to be honest, if I'm, I've asked myself, in the, to be fully honest, I think it's a little bit probable, my, purely at an instinctive level. I don't want to claim I have a basis for this. I think it's probable that Nyman's cheated more than twice. Yes. Um, but not certain. I think it's probable. And then that makes you think, well, then what exactly is Magnus doing? He's pointing to Nyman as a problem that represents this bigger problem. But that's known as psychological projection or scapegoating. It's not really ethical behavior. You know, um, What he could have done is lose the game, win the tournament, which is perfectly capable of doing even after losing the game, um, and then... Uh, then make a bigger issue after the event saying, look, I'm not saying he did it in this game, but I was uncomfortable during the game because I suspected him um, based on his prior behavior and based on information I've recently come across uh, through, through cross-referencing his games with engines or whatever. Um, and, then, and he might have done that behind the scenes with Nyman before going public with it or, or whatever. But the way he's done it is a kind of character assassination uh, on the basis of a game where it may not even have happened. Uh, so I think it's unfortunate. Um, I don't know if all publicity is good publicity here. You know, I don't know. I'm not sure what you think about that. I can't quite you, tell. Yeah, to me, it comes down to how much Hans is willing to sell out. Right. <laughs> there will be financial opportunities, but they may not be to play chess. So. Right. Yeah, yeah, I've heard about that. Yeah, he's been offered, I think, a million to pose naked for some <laughs> magazine. Yeah. But I think... Uh, more interesting 
is if he decides to get legal on whatever it is, slander or libel, I forget which would apply here, but um, the, you know, really Magnus has done something that's legally questionable. Uh, without good, without sufficient cause, he has seriously compromised someone's reputation and created doubt that will not leave this guy. You really can't prove a negative. This is the problem. If Magnus is willing to say he cheated, and I don't know how he did it, but he did, then how do you avoid that happening in any context? You know, the next time a player loses to a weaker player and it goes against statistical probability, you say he must have cheated. Of course you can't do that. We can't create that kind of culture. So I think Hans has a prima facie case for, you know, saying, Magnus, withdraw these comments, apologize, or I take you to court for damaging my reputation. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you'll do that, but I mean, that would be the next escalation move. Uh, and it wouldn't be completely unjustified, uh, although it would be troublesome because, of course, everything then comes out and the story wouldn't go away. And this would the whole chess world would be mired, mired in this for months. So I'm not recommending it. I'm just saying that it, it wouldn't astonish me if it happened. Yeah. Yeah, it'll it'll be interesting. And and getting back to what you were saying about the the potential biases of of people on on each side, uh, like you, I my base case at this point is that Hans cheated more online than he's admitted. That's my yeah. sheer my personal opinion. Um, my base case is still that I don't think he cheated over the board, although uh, I am by no means certain of that. Um, could certainly see evidence to. Uh, to change my mind. But to me, one thing that, that is somewhat compelling is just as I hear more about the story, hearing uh, that there were so many whispers about Hans that uh, grandmasters in particular seem to, to so wildly, um, or I guess wildly isn't the right word, widely um, suspect Hans of cheating, which is not something I was aware of. And I guess they did know his track record, which I did not. Um, but um have you been in touch, Jonathan? Have you talked to, to your Grandmaster peers much about their thoughts on this story? Not many. I, I know that when it initially broke, there was a few people I, I sort of did a, you know, WTF question mark about this, um, trying to understand what had gone on. Um, and everyone was as confused as I was because purely on the basis of the game. And this is the other thing that's important. I haven't met, I haven't heard of a strong player let's just say Grandmaster for now, uh, who thinks that the game itself is enough reason to doubt hands. I don't think the game itself really shows anything. It shows one player winning an opening battle, another having an off day. And I think, to be honest, important point here, put a nuance, is it's precisely because Carlson may have been wary of cheating and worried about cheating that he may have had an off day. Right. Uh, Self-reinforcing in that sense. Um, and then, yes, there was some nice de tactical details. There's this sort of e E3 and 94 idea somewhere deep in the line. But it's not, it, you know, I played through that game and I didn't see anything really jumping out at me as extraordinary. Slightly more extraordinary, by the way, was the game, I forget who it was against now, was it the Young Grandmaster uh, where, he, where he goes knight h2 and he... Oh, yeah. Was that the Mishra game? Yeah, that probably right. was the Mishra game. And then the knight stays there. And what, what's really interesting about it is that um, on the one hand, that knight's a kind of, you know, out of the game forever, but then so is the king, right? And right. so if you have the kind of foresight to think maybe the way things are going, the pieces will be swapped off, it isn't obvious that it's a bad idea. So I, again, I find it rather fascinating and interesting, but it's the sort of thing you'd expect a really talented young player to come up with and surprise you with. Um, you know, think of Ka some of Kasparov's uh, concepts in his better games. They do blow your mind a bit. Like I'm thinking maybe when he played Shirov and he played Rook takes B7 in the Shveshnikov followed by B4. Right, famous, Just played yeah. positionally. At the time, that was mind-blowing, right? In the same way, this Knight H2 thing is a bit mind-blowing, but these things are not unheard of. And if the guy's becoming a world-class grandmaster, as it looks like he is, it doesn't astonish me. Um, yeah, and that game in particular, I, I, I agree, it's a beautiful example. Like, cheating or no cheating, chess teachers should use that yeah. <laughs> as, instructive, as an instructive game. But that one took place at the, the Charlotte Chess Club. And again, I did speak with Peter Giannatos. They were quite vigilant. They were aware of... Uh, aware of um, Hans's 
online reputation prior to that game. So if he was getting some sort of assistance, again, as a, to quote Jakob Agard, it was some James Bond type stuff. Right, so, right, um, right. So you've, you've got to uh, put that into your um, your probability assessment. Um, That's nice. Yeah. That's really nice. Um, one, well, I want to add one thing. I was As the story has been unfolding, I've been remembering my uh, my PhD back in the day was on the concept of wisdom. And the way I tried to get the sense of what people thought of as wise as I relayed lots of little stories to them and asked them for their their sort of to talk them through what they thought was interesting, what was going on there. And one of the examples just reminds me of the Nyman uh, Carlson situation. It's really short and it's simply called Missing Axe. And it goes like this. A man whose axe was missing suspected his neighbor's son. The boy walked like a thief, looked like a thief and spoke like a thief. But the man found his axe while he was digging in the valley. And the next time he saw his neighbor's son, the boy walked, looked, and spoke like any other child. Right. And uh, it's apparently a traditional German story. And um, there's something like that going on. When you ask me about biases, if you start thinking someone's a cheat, almost everything they do will look, you know, like they might be cheating. Um, very important you don't we don't fall into that. At the same time, the flip side of that is please don't cheat because otherwise it'll be hard for us not to think you're cheating. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, Jonathan, I really appreciate your sharing your perspective. Do you have any uh, final thoughts to share before we, uh, we let you go? I don't think so. Only that uh, to plug briefly. Um, I do think the reason this story is so fascinating is not just for the chess world, it's for the whole, the whole world finds it intriguing. Um, and that's because it's prismatic in a certain sense. In other words, by looking at it, you see lots of other things. By looking through it, you sort of, other things are illustrated. Like I say, the sense of technology taking hold of our lives, the sense of the struggle to make sense of things, the, the role of elite people like Carlson and what they can get away with that others might not get away with, um, the place of the underdog, um, all of this kind of stuff is going on. And um, if you're interested in the relationship between chess and life, um, I did write a, a book about this, which we covered in the, in the last time we spoke, Ben, um, which is called The Moves That Matter, A Chess Grandmaster on the Game of Life. And it's about this kind of thing. It's about how chess, when you look at it deeply enough and closely enough, it brings with it the rest of the world. Um, but yeah. you just have to know how to inquire after it in the right way. Yeah, and and it's a fantastic book. I, I highly recommend it as well as Jonathan's other chess books. And uh, Jonathan, uh, last thing, do you have any other ongoing chess projects right now? Yeah, I'm actually about to start teaching online a little bit. And I've got a particular idea in mind that is not yet tested. I'm going to keep it secret, if you don't mind, until it's launched. But, okay. I, but I have a way, I mean, I've got a really busy life, and the only way it's going to work is if I can set aside a session during the week for a couple of hours and a session at the weekend for a couple of hours and just show up. I don't really have time to prepare lots of material, but I bring with me the lifetime of chess experience that I have. And then I have to kind of work with what's brought to me. And I want to do it in a way that is interactive and involves more than one person at a time. Um, and you'll be hearing more about that quite soon. Uh, but that is coming your way, yeah. Excellent. I'm interested. <laughs> so yeah, uh, hopefully you will uh, keep us posted online. I will. I will. And I may even tell you after the call, so, but I don't, want to, I don't want to share it completely with everyone yet. Okay. And is Twitter the best way to uh, to keep up with any uh, yeah, pending I announcements? Do, yeah, I think my, my Twitter account is probably the best for active things going on. And then I do have a website, jonathanrousen.me, if you want to know my story more generally. Excellent. All right. Well, Jonathan, really appreciate it. I feel like uh, it's grounding to speak to the likes of you. Um, and yeah, this we, we will see how events unfold. <laughs> yeah, likewise. Likewise. Thanks. Thanks for the offer. See you soon. I've been playing a bit of Blitz lately, and whenever I'm active online, it's fun to go to aimchess.com and ask their almighty algorithm to give me some insights from my games. It scrapes the sites, the playing sites automatically, and gives you actionable intel. In my case, 
The real takeaway this time was I got a 7% in resourcefulness in recent games. Um, That's not very good. I need to get better at that. I need to fight harder when I'm losing in a blitz game, look for tricks. And of course, aim chess, as it highlights various aspects of your game, strengths and weaknesses, uh, shows you positions from the game so that you can practice, you can review tactics that you missed uh, and learn lots and a fun way when you review. So please check out aimchess.com. If you decide to subscribe, use the code perpetual30. You can also use the link in the show description to get the same discount 30% off at aimchess.com. And we are here with a returning guest. He is a grandmaster, an award-winning author, uh, the 2020 ECF Book of the Year, The Complete Chess Swindler. He is a seven-time Olympian for his native Australia and an economics professor at the University of Brisbane. He is joining us from his home in Brisbane. Welcome back, grandmaster slash Dr. David Smurden. Thanks, Ben. It's great to be back. Yeah, I'm really glad to have you. Um, be, obviously, you're one of the many people I've wanted to have back on the show for a while. I know you're doing a lot of in, uh, interesting research connected to chess, but you're also sort of uniquely qualified to um, parse all of this cheating information or disinformation that's coming out. And in fact, you mentioned to me via email, David, that your research, some of your research is based on why people cheat in chess. So uh, I'd love to hear what you've uncovered on that so far. Yeah, it's been, I mean, it's been a long time since we last spoke. And in that time, I've moved away from, I guess, playing chess and tried to put more time into my academic career. Um, but yeah, I'm a special sort of economist. As a behavioral economist, it's um, a lot of uh, data analysis and running experiments uh, combined with theories from psychology. And it's actually kind of the perfect combination of skills to analyze a lot of these interesting questions uh, in the chess world as well. So there's a bunch of topics um, within chess, such as cheating, as you mentioned, that are of interest to the broader population and to economists in general, because things like dishonest behavior and cheating are big issues when you think about things like tax compliance, being honest on your tax returns, uh, insurance fraud, insurance premiums obviously go up if you have more dishonesty. And these days, since the pandemic, um, university exams is another big one. Uh, Contract cheating has become a big issue in the education sector. And all of these things have negative consequences for the broader economy as well. They hurt the innocent people in these various fields. Uh, and so analyzing these things is, is really important for economists and policymakers, but it's hard to get good uh, data on, on cheating behavior because if you can get good data and find out when people are cheating, then people aren't going to be cheating because they know they can right. get caught. So it's very, very hard to find the perfect situation to test our theories and analyze the data. And chess just happens to have all those ingredients where you can do this analysis. So obviously I'm, I'm doing research in chess also because I love chess personally. I like to keep my hand in things, but it actually serves a really useful purpose to, I guess, my, my wider professional field. Yeah, it's a great blend. And you mentioned that in some of your research, uh, presumably this research, you work some with a uh, hot man of the month, uh, Dr. Kenneth Regan, as well as uh, chess.com. Yeah, uh, I guess in in a way, it's kind of a, a small network of, of individuals and organizations who work on this topic. So it makes sense that we kind of know each other. Um, we approach things from different angles, but also it makes a lot of sense that we share information and techniques because we're all basically on the same page with what we want to achieve, like what, what we want for, for chess. Um, now, um, with, with Ken, I've had the chance to talk to him a lot since, since the early days about his algorithm, better understanding um, how it works, what he's done, how that's evolved, so I have a good understanding there. Um, my relationship with chess.com uh, is, is particularly exciting. So it's not, um, I don't work for chess.com, they don't pay me or anything like this, but um, we have this, this collaboration where I'm, I'm able to use some of the data that they produce, um, analyze some of the stuff that they've done, particularly their anti-cheating team, and also try to suggest things and approach things from, I guess, a more behavioral perspective to think about different mechanisms for identifying when do people uh, get tempted to cheat Are they likely to re-offend? What are the sort of policies we can put in place, particularly for juniors, to try to stop them ever crossing that ethical line in the first place? So that's kind of the angle that I'm more interested in. And I 
I um, collaborate with a cognitive psychologist, Christopher Chabri. I think you may, oh, yeah. may have even had him uh, on the podcast. Yeah. Very, very well established um, uh, cognitive psychologist. Uh, and and others, um, other researchers as well who, who work on this. So we're all kind of, I don't know, one family approaching the topic of chess cheating, but I guess from slightly different perspectives. That's interesting. I'd seen from online interactions, I could tell that you you knew Christopher Shabri some, but I didn't know that you guys were actually uh, collaborating. Um, so David, are you, so with this research, are you working on a paper or what's the sort of end goal? Yeah, there are a couple of papers I'm working on. That's basically the currency of academics. You know, if you want to get established in this profession, you are typically judged for promotion and things like this on, on the papers you produce. Uh, unfortunately, in economics, papers have a, a longer cycle, publishing cycle. So I have a, quite a few chess-related projects on the go uh, at the moment, um, not just on um, cheating, but also things like um, gender in particular, and I've got some publications already there. Uh, with the chess cheating data, uh, it's there's a, there's a dual purpose. So professionally, the idea is to publish papers, and we have a couple of um, projects. One that involves looking at the internal chess.com uh, data on, on, on cheaters, on banned players, and try to analyze patterns there. And another where we try to run what we call experiments, but essentially like trialing different interventions to reduce the likelihood of cheating. And the, the second goal of these projects is obviously, of course, to try to provide some benefit to the chess community. And that's why chess.com is interested in these collaborations, because all of these things will hopefully serve a purpose to them and to the wider community in trying to reduce the incidence of cheating. Okay. And obviously, we don't want to um, blunt the impact of the, the papers that you're working on. But is there anything you can share in terms of things you've discovered in terms of uh, both like what motivates people and what might deter them from cheating? So because as is sort of like infamous now, because chess.com is quite um, secretive about their cheating, cheating data and, and for good reason, um, there is only so much that I can can say at this point. And obviously the paper will be to some extent, um, reporting things on an aggregate level, broader level. Right. But because I know that the chess world has a really interesting appetite for this stuff, I actually did, uh, two years ago, I did a big survey online that I knew was not going to be a publication and that didn't use chess.com data because I wanted to make it public. I wanted everything to get out there and a discussion to happen. So it didn't really help my professional career, but I thought, okay, this is just a good thing to do. So I ran a survey of about a 1,000 people online around the world uh, chess players for different levels who could anonymously give information about have they ever cheated in the past? How many times have they done it? Why did they cheat? What were the reasons? What happened later? You know, things like this, their motivations. Uh, and I made a lot of that information public and um, in general, people who want that, that data, I, I've shared it with them and spoken to them. And that was quite insightful um, to me. So I guess Probably uh, I, I should talk about that a little bit if you're interested. Yes, you should. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I, I mean, I did post some stuff about this in the past, but I think like one of the one of the big things to me is that um, a lot of people, a higher percentage of people than I would have expected, have cheated at some point in their lives. It was about twenty um, percent of people have cheated at some point in their lives, but the good news is that in the vast majority of cases it only happened once. So they sort of, they tried it, they wanted to see whether they could get away with it and they felt awful afterwards and, and, and they didn't do it again. Uh, in, in some cases, they did it online um, using an engine in sort of like the tr traditional way that we think about cheating it these days. So on chess.com, using an engine, got caught, chess.com approached them with their typical sort of second chance policy and that was enough for that person to sort of say, yeah, I'm never doing this again. So chess.com has this policy basically in place. And I should say, you know, I'm not employed by them, but I can say very objectively, I've been very impressed by the way that they've, they've handled cheating in general over the past couple of years. Their anti-cheating team, they've put a lot of resources into that, resources that they could have put into growing their business and making more money, right? It doesn't really serve their purpose to highlight cheating on their site but they do it anyway. And in general, I think they just come from a very good place with this stuff. And this policy that they have of saying to people who, who cheat online, okay, we've caught you, here's the evidence. If you confess and say you'll never do it again, you get this second chance. 
um, the incidence of uh, reoffending is very, very low after that, which I think shows that their strategy seems to work. And that was also one of the messages that came through on the survey that I did. Okay. Well, that's, that's reassuring. And then do you make any conclusions about repeat offenders? Is there like a separate uh, conclusion when you analyze their behavior and their motivations? Uh, well, so I'll come to that. Well, okay. One thing I can say directly about that is that that's something that I'm working on now at the moment is one of my projects, um, which, which also means that I can't say too much about it, unfortunately. But I can say that I think it's very important to make clear that that percentage is very, very small. Um, mm-hmm. The other thing that came out of my survey, um, well, there, there were many things that came out. But the other thing related to this specifically is that um, actually two-thirds of those who said that they'd cheated at some point uh, said it was engine use. Now, I would have thought that it would be much, much higher. But actually, one third of the time, it wasn't engine use. It was things like um, using chess books while you're playing the game uh, or having a database open while you're playing the game or things like this or having somebody else, a stronger player, help me out next to me, uh, giving me tips. And for those, uh, for that group, which was about a third of the people who cheated, uh, their motivation was mainly around trying to improve, trying to get better. Uh, now, they were still crossing a line, but a lot of the time they said, well, I, we didn't actually think it was that bad in terms of cheating. We didn't think it was such a big deal compared to using engines or something like that. And I had a noble reason to do it. I wanted to improve. Now, it's still wrong. It's still cheating. And for the most part, where they were made aware of that, they didn't cross the line again. But it's that. So, but that's that's still a pretty big chunk. You know, it's it's it's. One third of the time, it's not engine use. It's it's two third of the time is engine engine use out of that twenty percent of people who've ever tried it before, and then most of those never go on to reoffend. So once you drill all the way down to what we consider the worst of the worst in chess, which is elite professional players who repeatedly cheat, we're talking about fractions of percentages here. Okay. Now, I did, I quoted you when I was interviewing Yakabaga because I'd seen in an exchange with Mr. Daji where you said, uh, uh, you said on Twitter that when you see the list of players who've offend, who've uh, been flagged by chess.com, obviously you can't name the players, but you just said it can't be unseen, uh, which obviously to me um, suggests that either it's, it's either a high quantity of titled players or a, um, or uh, quite notable titled players or some combination of, of them both. Now, I understand if you need to punt entirely, David, but is there anything more you can say about what what uh, what what surprised you about the list? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, these are sort of topics that understandably I have to tread slightly carefully. So I won't, you know, go into it in too much detail, but I think... Um, I think just from a personal perspective, people are often talking about, we want to see the list. We want to see the list uh, of players. It's well, the first thing to say at a, at a very general level is to go back to that point about the way that chess.com's approach things with all of its account members, but let's particularly focus on the title players and particularly focus on the GMs to give them these second chances to, to deal with these things privately I can see arguments for why people would criticize that perspective. Don't get me wrong. I totally see this. But the evidence, the empirical evidence is that this approach that they use drastically reduces the incidence of reoffending. And, you know, they get this slap on the wrist. It doesn't go public. um, They don't seem to cheat again. Now, you, you may say, well, maybe they just become really, really smart at cheating. But we're talking about that would mean that 100% 100% of them go from being dumb cheaters to smart cheaters overnight. Like that's really unlikely to happen. So I'd say that their policy, the evidence seems to be there that it works pretty well. That's the first thing. But then just from a, just from a personal perspective, you know, people who think that it's such a great thing to look at this list. Well, I'm in this really sometimes awkward situation because I have friends who I know are on the list. Mm-hmm. But they don't know that I know. I can't tell them that I know. And sometimes every now and then you're in these conversations where they might be talking about cheating. Yeah, I'm sure this person's cheating, blah, blah, blah. And that's just a super uncomfortable situation (laughs) because it's like, it's like, I don't know, knowing that one of your friends cheated on their partner or something like this, but you can't tell them that, you know, and you have to listen to them talking. And and I, I don't know, it's, it's, so sometimes I'm in these situations where it's uncomfortable. So I guess I just wanted to mention in that brief Twitter exchange that it's not, 
all rosy to see these things. Yeah, well, I think I, the context that came up in the podcast was was uh, Jesse Cry saying that he hadn't wanted to see the list. Mm. So I think at least some people um, are are aware of that. That yeah, it will it will be some names that would that would surprise yeah um, people. And David, how familiar are you with the workings of? Uh, I mean, again, and I know this is a proprietary, proprietary excuse me, in Chess.com's case, uh, how their algorithm works, but also uh, Dr. Regan's algorithm. I know that you've got a statistical and mathematical background. Um, so, do you do you understand fully how it works, how they work? Yeah, yeah, um, I do. I, I guess I'm kind of, like I said, in my life, almost through you know, happenstance and chance, I've ended up with a particular set of skills and experiences that just happened to put me in a, in a good place for this stuff. So, you know, it's just by chance that this happened. Um, and I've had the chance to talk to, to Ken about his, his stuff and see how it's evolved over time as well. It's not just an outdated stagnant system. Like he updates this stuff, he improves this stuff. And he's also more open than chess.com in terms of saying what it does do and doesn't do as well. Chess.com has has a team of people working on this. They also have not been stagnant. They've been updating this over time, improving it, making it better. They obviously have access to some tools that Ken doesn't, for instance, um, pixel clicking technology and things like this, you know, the other signs of cheating that obviously Ken doesn't look at. Um, and they've run their their system, which which they've they've shown to me. We had a, a long session about that. They they've also shown it to people better than me, like a professor of statistics at Harvard and things like this. Um, so the systems are really good. Of course, they're not foolproof, no question about that. But uh, what what I'm really impressed by is that um, they, they were good to begin with. They've put lots of effort into making them better. And like I said, in chess.com's case, they've put manpower and resources into things that um, are not really profit maximizing from a business perspective. So that's really impressed me as well that they've done this. Um, now, now, you remember that comment by Fabiano Caruana, uh, I think it was last week, he had some doubts about Ken's algorithm. Did yeah. you hear that one? Was this the one about, he's curious about if you back-tested uh, Hans's um, games where he got flagged uh, for the, the chess.com cheating system, would Ken's system... Um, catch them. I know that he had a few comments about Dr. Regan's algorithm. Yeah, that one's an interesting one doing backtesting. And I think backtesting is something that's really important to to stress test these algorithms. Um, I know chess.com does a lot of work on that. And I think there's more stuff to be done there. But uh, there was a comment that Fabiano made where he said, uh, he said, I'd, I would take Ken's analysis with a grain of salt because I know with 100% certainty of this one player who was cheating and was investigated and Ken um, exonerated him. Yeah, um, I remember that. Yeah, so I think, so Fabiana's choice of words was poor in that case because he said exonerated. That's not how these algorithms work. You either have enough evidence or you have insufficient evidence, but you don't you don't prove someone innocent. But I think, you know, that's just a, that's a wording thing, like just a, uh, an accidentally bad choice of wording. But... This case, um, so I don't know Fabiano's case. I also know of a case, though, with a strong grandmaster in the US who, who um, did, cheated in a, um, one of these big international opens, and it could be the same one, or it could be a different one. Who knows? It could be the same one. But there are going to be these, these occasions where this, this happens and it doesn't get picked up. Statistically, that's going to happen. But I think like the... The key point is that these algorithms are really good. They do a really good job a lot of the time. And even though this, this cheating thing has not been in the public eye much in, in recent years, I think there's a misconception that because of that, because it's been quiet, that things haven't been done, like people haven't been taking it seriously, it hasn't been moving. And that's definitely not the case. There's actually been a heck of a lot done by a lot of really good people in the last couple of years that has, you know, hasn't been made public, improving the algorithms, finding cheaters, uh, talking to them, uh, trying to reduce the, the risk of incidents in the future. So there has been a lot of stuff done. Just because it's not in the public doesn't mean that this isn't an issue that has been taken seriously for a while now. That That's good to hear. And and I have a follow-up on that. But cir circling back to the Fabiano um, comment just for a second, because you'd said perhaps it's the same tournament. But 
Um, Fabiano said that in in the case he was referring to that the player, as you said, he said exonerated, which was perhaps not the best mm. word choice, but basically was not um, w- received no punishment for yep. um, just the the result stood. Um, so in the case that you're referring to, the result also stood. The yeah, case yeah. that you know of. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I know of a few cases, um, but this. I assume that this one sounded the most like what Fabiano was saying, and yeah, it's the it, it's the um, the way the story went is that there was no punishment um, meted out. Yeah. Okay, and Fabiano in that in that exchange described it in in his interpretation as an open and shut case. Uh, now, obviously, in this case, this is probably a question I should ask Fabiano. But what what would you describe as an open and shut case? It's just if the algorithm says there is sufficient as evidence, or um, cause I wasn't, I wasn't sure how to parse open and shut. Like, did he, you know, does it mean you, you found the smoking gun or just the statistical evidence is so high? I don't know what Fabiana was referring to there. I yeah. think it would be nice, be nice to know in general with a lot of these things, it would be nice to have a bit more information, particularly when people are using anecdotal cases to support a large claim. In this case, the large claim is, is that, um, Perhaps we shouldn't trust Ken Regan's algorithm. That's essentially the claim, and that's a that's a valid point to make. And Carolina, I mean, is one of the most respected chess players out there. I have a lot of time for him. He's usually very measured in these things. But uh, this one anecdote is not what I would use as as evidence for this. But if we can sort of pull together enough evidence and say, okay, here are some situations where doing this backtracking, like you said, the algorithm is is not holding up, but we look at the other algorithms that are in place. We look at chess.coms, we look at Lee Chesses, and we say, okay, these ones are doing a good job in these circumstances. Why aren't these ones doing a good job and how do we improve them? If we can go through that process, then I think everybody wins. Okay. And getting to what you're saying about um, perhaps misusing data, I don't know. Um, as we record this on September 27th, Tuesday night, uh, for me, Wednesday for you, <laughs> there across the world, um, a few videos have come out in the past couple of days, uh, and actually Fabiano himself, most recently with uh, Christian Carilla on their new podcast, we're going through some of Hans's games, and these are games where on chess base the features called Let's, Let's Check, but obviously with the chess.com cap score or the Lee Chess Senapon, I mean, they, these are all ways, as far as I understand them, of measuring uh, the quality of your moves compared to engine choices, and they're finding some games where Hans, they say, played historically well. I've seen you weigh in a little bit online on this, but what was your overall impression of uh, of um, these <laughs> findings? Yeah, it's a um, this is a thorny question for me. I'm going to try to put it, give it a positive spin. But before I get into that, okay, let me let me switch it back to you for a second. So sure. there've been lots of these videos about the let's check feature on, on chess base to be used as an anti-cheating tool. Let me ask you, how does let's check work? Yeah, I don't, I've, I've used, I use the game analysis on chess.com and Lee chess. I have chess base. I'm a chess base user, but I didn't even know it was there until mm-hmm. these, until these videos. So, I mean, if you, if you want to um, want for me to give an embarrassing guess, I'm, I'm happy to, but I really don't know. Okay, imagine that you run Let's Check on a game, and Let's Check says that you got a 70% score, engine correlation score. Next question, what do you think that means? Okay, yeah, my guess would be that that means that uh, 70% of the moves match the top engine choice. Okay, which engine, what parameters? Right. You can say you don't know if you don't know, but like, would you have any idea of how that's measured? I mean, I would think around a baseline of Stockfish 15 here today with like a 30 depth, something like that. But Okay. And if you play the second best move, but it's 0.01 centipawns lower than the first best, for that move, would you get a zero score or a one score or something in between? Yeah, these these are good questions for sure. Yeah. And uh, and I, the, do, do all the algorithms do them the same or are they done differently? I'm going to keep pinging you with one more question and then I'll I'll stop it because this is not how interviews work. I know, but imagine you score a 70% against someone rated 2,400 and you score a 75% against someone rated 2,300. In which of those games do you think you played better? Uh, I would think the 75% against the 2,300. Okay. So, uh, 
the reason I'm asking all these questions is that, first of all, nobody except for chess base knows how let's check work. There are all these okay. possibilities for how it works. There is zero information out there. If you go through the manual in chess base, the only thing that it says about let's check engines correlation is that you should not use it for cheating detection. That's okay. the only thing that's in there about it. None of this stuff is made public. What's more, if you play against someone lower rated, on average, you will get a higher score because it's more likely to be able to find the best moves against someone who's weaker. Okay. They yeah. give you the opportunity to just play a move that wins on the spot. They don't set you as many problems over the board. And this is not something that is um, debatable. Like we can debate the degree about this, but empirically it's just a fact. You can just check it, right? So that's there. So unless you're controlling for the opponent's score, you're already running into trouble. In addition, it's not taking anything into account in terms of the complexity of the position as well, the sorts of moves, uh, the sort of positions you're going to get, and also the differences between the first and the second move. And to give you just one anecdotal example, one of the games where Hans got an 100% let's check score, uh, which is one of the ones that's been used in a lot of these videos, he actually had an average centipawn loss of 35, which is quite a lot, 0.35, and he blundered. Now, how can an engine correlation give you a 100% score for playing the best move, which means 100% of the time you play the best move if he played a blunder in that game? So I don't know the answer for why that's being spat out by the system. <laughs> but what is clear is that this, this alone is not enough. Uh, and it's, in fact, it's not even close to enough. And the, I, it's hard for me to like talk about this without kind of um, sounding kind of elitist and you know, you guys don't know what you're talking about sort of thing because that's, uh, that's not what I'm about. There's a lot of smart people who are using this feature and it makes sense to use this feature because it's definitely the easiest to, to do. You open chess base and you click a button and you get a score and you can start comparing scores, which is great, but it's, it's just, it is so far below the sophistication of the anti-cheating algorithms that are in place at the moment, which is so far below um, and can be misused in these ways where you're not taking account of something as simple as the opponent's rating, that I'm worried that it's going to lead to future allegations and future misrepresentations about the data to other players without letting, without this, this huge body of work and knowledge that we've accumulated um, going through the, the normal processes. I'm, I'm not really um, I'm not really explaining this very well, but do you kind of get a sense about my concerns here? Yeah, I do. And I did listen to Ken Regan's interview with uh, James Altucher, where he talked about uh, a lot of the nuts and bolts of yeah. how he how he makes how he makes his algorithm. And I can certainly he, um, I can see what you're saying in terms of like it, if we don't know if if it's quite possible that they're not using those sort of distinctions in terms of the complexity of the position and the quality of the first engine choice compared to the second engine choice, then I can see how it's a very blunt instrument. Yeah, I look. I mean, and now I feel a little bit uh, guilty about the way that I portrayed that because I should say some things. So just on the Hans Neiman case specifically, uh, there's definitely evidence that he's played extremely well in the past in tournaments that perhaps uh, weren't brought to light before. Now, not in a way where the algorithms are spitting out, you know, the red flashing lights or anything like that. But, I mean, th there may well be a correlation between some of these statistical evidences that have been done on his games and even some of these let's check things, you know, some correlation, but not in the way that people at the moment seem to be using the let's check feature on YouTube or Twitter or whatever to say it's clear that he's either a cheater or the best player in history. Like that, that's simply not true. But one thing that I will say that's also quite positive is that I like some of these videos where they go through these games move by move and particularly strong players give their their thoughts about that. Yeah. Now that can be quite useful. And that's weird for me to say, because I'm a data guy, like I do big data, machine learning, and in behavioral economics, you deal with expert biases all the time, like forensic DNA analysis and analysts who, you know, in court cases, um, 
do the wrong thing when it comes to fingerprint analysis or blood analysis because they've got their own biases in place. Now, this is their job as forensic experts and they're, they're, you know, it's someone's either going to prison or not and they're making these mistakes. And that same sort of stuff can happen in chess, which is why we rely on data as our first port of call for this stuff. However, data by itself is not enough because it, it's always going to miss some human stuff. Always, no matter how sophisticated your algorithms are. Ken talks about this as well, that he comes at it from a completely objective uh, perspective, but that it has its own limitations. And the chess.com guys, with their particularly their fair play and their anti-cheating team, there is a process. You know, if you're a title player and the algorithm comes out and says it's very likely you cheated, they don't immediately ban you, right? It goes to their GM experts to go through the games and give a human perspective. And I think it's really, really important uh, particularly with something as sensitive as, as cheating, where you're either doing the worst thing possible in the world in chess or you've been accused of the worst thing possible in the world of chess. You know, either, either the scenario is horrible, right? I think it's really important to be able to take in all these perspectives. So one thing that came out of FIDE's statement was this idea of a panel. I don't know if you saw that. They mentioned somewhere. Yeah. I yeah. Did. As far as I know, nothing has, has come of it so far, but I know that's something that chess.com has also thought about this idea of can we try to somehow distance this process from all of these bodies that that may not have um a hundred percent uh impartial view of things or, or may have some skin in the game or whatever can we get an independent panel where we have statistical experts we bring in the algorithms from all of the major sites and platforms who are working on this stuff and put them together we build a case with data and with human analysis and let this independent panel of experts from different angles try to make a comprehensive judgment on things. And I think that could be a good thing for chess. I don't know how it's going to work. <laughs> I don't, someone's got to actually you know, get off their feet and do it. But I think that could be a great thing because it would also kind of shield FIDE and shield chess.com and shield Ken from a lot of this criticism and kind of put in, in place a process that we can all agree on and then abide by that that sort of decision. Yeah, that that would be fantastic. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, this this story has mostly been a downer to me, <laughs> but <laughs> me that that would be a good thing that, that would come out of this. Um, so I I feel somewhat compelled to ask David. I have a feeling, you know, I really appreciate your sort of a uh, clinical unbiased perspective on this matter. But but do you have uh, whether you there leanings you want to state or just like the human urge since you work in behavioral economics when you try to parse all this evidence of uh did he or didn't he like do you, do you have your uh leanings that you have to sort of then try to mute there's one thing i try to do with both this research and, and pretty much all my research i work on some very sensitive topics like not just things like gender differences in chess you know that's not a big deal for the world but i work on things like uh, female genital mutilation in Africa, like big topics yeah. on that. Like how do we deal with this big ethical conundrums as well? I try to stay as objective as possible. And also I try not to give an opinion when I feel that I can't give an opinion at this stage. So when it comes to say the Hans stuff, I haven't seen Ken's analysis on Hans's games and I haven't seen chess.com's analysis on his past games, including his over the board games. I know that both of these parties have done these analyses themselves. And um, without that information, I don't think that I could give um, a judgment on it. So um, so that's why I won't give an opinion on Hans's case, not because I'm trying to be secretive, because I literally forced myself not to give an opinion until I've seen the evidence that I know that I would need to, to make a call. Now they've got that evidence. I don't know what call that they're making. Like obviously they've made some public statements, but for me, I, I can't do it. Um, one thing that I would say is that I agree with people like Matthew Sadler and a few others who say that um, the incidence of high level 2,600 plus grandmaster cheating is extremely low. Um, there are some, you know, some, some, some comments that this are made. Is this over the board? Yeah, yeah, particularly okay. over the board. I think it's extremely low. And one of the reasons for that is that the consequences are just so large if you get caught. For all of these people, it's their professional lives. Um, we saw what happened to Sebastian Feller's career um, after he got caught cheating, um, Rousis. I mean, it's just a 
such a massive risk for someone who is already at 2,600 strength to do that I imagine the, I, I'm, I'm sure it's not zero, but I imagine the incidence is extremely low. That, that's a good point. And it's somewhat reassuring. Now, let me ask you, David, like obviously with the chess.com team, um, the, they do have, again, proprietary information where maybe they're able to um, look at clicking away from your screen or where your eyes go or w- whatever it may be. But their, their uh, algorithm, as far as I understand it, is predominantly data driven. So do you think in OTB chess, would it be sufficient to uh, catch, air quotes, catch someone cheating on a sheerly data driven uh, type analysis? I still think that the, the, the data driven algorithms are the best way to go for your first step, for sure. Um, even with over the board chess and Ken has managed to uh, um, make a lot of uh, really important cases that have been brought to his intention for over the board cheating in the past at, at different levels. So I still think that's the way to go. If there were to be such a, an independent panel that we're talking about um, this sort of idea, if a case is brought forward and it gets to a point where the data driven evidence suggests very strongly that someone's cheating, um, I would like to see some sort of process after that involving the panel and the suspected player. Um, Maybe, I don't know exactly the format, maybe some sort of testing or something else or asking some questions about the game, some sort of process like this, which has a human element that you might also see in some other sports as well when someone is suspected or that we have, for example, in university cheating, if we strongly suspect that someone um, cheated in an exam. Uh, you can sort of have some other sort of processes in place that involve um, that uh, interactive um, engagement between a panel and the person. So so I think that we don't just have to stop at the data and say that's the end of the story. Data says yes or no, and we have to make a call. I think that we could try to gather more information after that. And if if we tried and we failed, (laughs) where would that leave us? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, so... With, with cheating, just like in any domain, it's got to be a, a multi-pronged approach. So you can have an approach looking at the physical environment. We've already seen this with delays on game broadcasts and all these sort of detections that go in place. I don't think that's, it's never going to be fully enough. Technology is always, always going to go ahead of us to some extent. So we can do a lot and doing a lot also makes a lot of sense. We see this with things like, you know, shoplifting or whatever else or stopping people from breaking into your home. You can never um, perfectly prevent that from happening because there's always going to be people with sophisticated enough tools to do it, but you really want to stop that low-hanging fruit um, to make it, you, you're going to stop making it easy for people. So you've got that physical side of things. Then you've got the, the punishment side of things as well. Like if you can't prevent an activity from happening, you make the punishments high enough to deter people from doing that. We've seen that in cases like doping and in cycling and other sports as well. Like you can basically change the length of the stick that you use to try to deter people (laughs) from doing things. And then there's the behavioral approach that seems like the soft approach, but I quite like it. I guess it fits into my mold, which is what are the things that you can do for people uh, when they first offend, when you first sort of get suspicions, statistical suspicions that they're cheating in like a soft way, maybe online, you know, in, in non-titled Tuesday games, just for, for rating or something. Like what can you do at that point? And what can you do even before that point when you think people might be at a stage where they may be susceptible to this stuff? And to give you an example, in this survey that I did, one of the biggest differences between people who said that they'd ever cheated and people who said that they'd never cheated, one of the biggest differences in these two groups is how prevalent you thought cheating was in the chess world oh interesting now now people who've ever tried cheating were thought that there was five times more cheating going on in the chess world than people who'd never tried cheating yeah huge differences which means that things about the social acceptance of cheating peer pressure that sort of stuff plays a big role now if you go into if you do any coaching in in schools or or in junior chess clubs quite often you'll find something where it, it may come to your intention as a coach that, well, this kid here, yeah, yeah, he might be able to, he may have got all the homework right, but we all know that he cheats. Like he uses an engine on chess.com. And often the coach won't really say anything because they don't really know how to deal with that situation. But you've got a situation where 
like the other kids know that someone's cheating, but it's still like kind of accepted. Like we won't do it. We know he does it, but we're not shunning him or anything like that. But that would be a point where some sort of behavioral intervention makes sense. Like this, this can't be normalized because the more people that you think are doing it, the more likely you are to think that it might be something to try. And that's something we haven't really spoken a lot about in the chess world, but I think it's an important prong in our multi-pronged approach. Yeah, uh, that that makes sense. Yeah, and and it does, like you say, a multi-pronged approach is definitely in order as we, you know, as the sort of scope of this particular controversy starts to recede and we start to think about just how to move forward. Um, well, David, while I have you here, I want to ask you a little bit about your your other chess related research in particular, but, but do you have anything to, to add or summarize any advice for the chess community regarding this, uh, this particular controversy? Well, I would like something positive to come out of it because at, at the moment we're in a negative sum state of affairs where Magnus's reputation has taken a hit. Hans's reputation has taken a hit and nobody's really come out of it on the positive side, except for a few streamers who've increased their subscriptions, but that's right. about it. But I would, I would like to, like right now, the pulse is pumping. We're in a moment where if there's ever going to be a big action to be taken, the appetite is there uh, now. And so from I haven't really commented about, about Magnus. You know, it's, it's hard to wade into an opinion about the world champion, of course, particularly if you're in this world as I am. I would say that, um, I mean, he could have handled the situation better. I, I would say that as just a starting point. But one thing about this is that if the world champion acts, the world takes notice. We're talking about this. And while we've got this conversation going, while we've got statements from chess.com, we've got statements from FIDE, um, from chess organizers, I think if we wanted to really make a good go of setting something up that is you know, hard to do, but setting something up, reviewing our processes and making a good go changing the system now's the time so i hope this happens i don't know who's going to do it who's going to stand up and do it but that could be the positive that comes out of it and that could be like i guess one positive out of out of magnus's actions okay yeah never let a crisis go to waste yeah (laughs) that's that's right yeah (laughs) um yeah and uh, that's excellent advice and i i hope it does come to to fruition it does feel like it's sort of a unique moment in terms of like there's a leadership, I don't know if uh, vacuum is the right word, but um, FIDE doesn't seem to to be totally on top of this. And chess.com is going through a transition with acquiring Play Magnus. They've got a lot on their plate, yeah. but um, but yeah, hopefully uh, hopefully some good will, will come of this because I'm getting, uh, just a, a last thing on this, I'm just getting increasingly pessimistic that we'll, we'll ever know. And I don't know how that will shake out with, uh, with Hans playing tournaments. Um, given Magnus's statement on Monday. Yeah, that's. Uh, it, it may also be the case, like you say, that we never truly know um, the truth about um, about the allegations against Hans. That could be. Um, but I don't think that's the end of the world if that happens. Like, it sounds like, you know, it's, it's unresolved. We need something. But I think we can still get good stuff coming out of this, having this discussion even if we have this unresolved issue that's kind of going to always be a small blemish on the chess world. Right. And I suppose if Hans continues to perform at a 2700, 2750 level at some point, uh, that would speak for itself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <That's the thing. laughs> well, um, let's see. Yeah, that's far ahead of uh, where we are now. Um, so let's talk about the Fighting Chess Index. I forgot to mention it at the beginning. Um, <laughs> it's another great contribution to the chess world. For for listeners who aren't familiar with it, um, could could you just explain the idea behind it, first of all, David? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it seems like such a, um, a wet topic after we move away from chess cheating. <laughs> but th- there was a period of time in the chess world where this was the biggest issue in the chess world, uh, the good old days where we were worried about people drawing too much, having, you know, sharing the point too quickly at the top level. So short draws in particular. And that was the big blemish on the chess world, the big stain on the chess world. And uh, it's something, again, this is something that I did in my spare time. That's not, you know, part of um, my economics career. It's not going to be a publication or anything, but um, there are all these different things have been put forward about um, 
how do we stop the short draw problem? Should we stop, stop the short draw problem? Uh, all these sort of things. And I thought, well, um, from a behavioral perspective, seeing as chess players are professionals who make their livelihood from tournament invitations and things like this, uh, wouldn't it be nice to have some sort of ranking, some sort of index or metric or something where from a data-driven perspective, we could say here is a more fighting or combative player than this player. And I wanted to do it in in an objective way just to put the list there because what we've seen in, I particularly work in development economics and these sort of things, what we've seen is that these published rankings, particularly like cross-country rankings, like corruption index or world development index or gender equality index or whatever that the UN and World Bank put forward, you might think they don't have any bite, they don't have any teeth. But just having those indexes there can actually uh, prove to be quite useful at a grassroots level. So within these countries, you might have organizations, small grassroots organizations, activists, political parties, whatever, who like having something that they can point to. And then on the other side of things, people who are working towards this stuff can say, look, we've made progress. Look at our ranking. It's gone from here to here and things like this. So in general, I think that rankings just by themselves are kind of a low cost way to uh, empower organizations that are, that are working on different topics. And in this case, uh, it's, it's a little bit simpler than that. I just wanted organizers to be able to see which players seem to be a little bit more fighting than others and to encourage other players to try to play in such a way or behave in such a way to increase their, their spot on that ranking list. Yeah, and it's been a while. Like you say, it's kind of... Um, um, receded to the background lately yeah, but yeah. you can you I, I remember some of the people low on the fighting index but can you remind me who the top <laughs> performers were <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it 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 uh, got a bit of attention in its early days because i presented six different ways that you could do the rankings depending on what you considered more or less important aspects of being a combative player but no matter which way you did it in the top 50 players in the world, Timur Rajabov came last. It came last right. every time. And so that, that received a bit of attention, even from you know, Timur himself. But the idea was not to attack any particular player because if a player keeps getting invited all the time because of their chess rating and they can maintain their chess rating optimally by playing short draws to conserve energy against you know, their friends or whatever else, then they're acting in a perfectly rational way. And you know, as an economist... I should be expecting people to act rationally. So it wasn't having a go at Rajabov. In the same way that we saw that in in more recent years, uh, Anand actually dropped his competitiveness compared to in in his earlier years as world champion, for example. And uh, he actually performed quite well in recent years in tournaments like the World Rapid and World Blitz. He basically retired from being, you know, the professional that he was, the Tiger, uh, and played in a, I guess, more conservative way where he often would take short draws uh, against strong players and smash a lot of others in these tournaments that are incredibly energy sapping and exhaustive. And that worked very well for him. He scored very well. He didn't score well on the fighting chess index, but it was optimal for his play. And again, that's not having a, an attack at him necessarily, but I still wanted to put these rankings up there and you could see players like Duda, this was before Duda was actually being invited to the very big events, by the way. So Duda, um, Le Quam Liam from Vietnam, David Navara, Richard Report, a lot of players who anecdotally have a reputation for being fighting players, for being combative, for playing interesting chess. They were coming out in a purely data-driven approach as at the top of the fighting chess index score. Um, and I, I thought that was kind of nice that people's... Um, intuition and anecdotes were being reflected uh in the metrics yeah that that is nice and, and it's as you say it's a useful tool and, and people like to be ranked and measured and things and and david you you mentioned an email to me that that you're using this in some of your uh, gender-based uh chess research yeah yeah so uh i mean gender is there was a time when gender was the biggest issue in chess of course as well so we <laughs> right. keep switching between these hot topics gender is as, as we speak today, um, 28th of September, Australian time, it's, it's currently trending a bit more than the cheating because there was an incident in the official commentary of a major women's event last night. I don't know if you saw this, Ben. Yeah, but, I uh, did. The commentator um, 
uh, older white male commentator made some comments that, uh, and I mean, I don't mention his name because it's most likely he didn't have any spiteful reasons for it. It may have been joking, but anyway, it, they, they came across very sexist and misogynistic and we've had this happen in the past. Uh, and it, it brings back this, this larger debate, which is that why don't we have more women at the top of chess, which you know, we've rehashed this. You must've had people on your podcast about yeah. this. And I'm very interested in this topic because as economists, we're very interested in the low number of women in STEM. So the science, technology, engineering, mathematics, these fields. Why is that the case? Why are we seeing low number of women graduates in STEM degrees in universities, even though girls actually score higher than boys in STEM subjects at high school on average. So something's happening around these ages from high school to, to university and then onwards. And we see that in chess as well. We see the same thing happening. Like there's um, about 30% of, uh, of under 18s are girls up until the age of 16, 17, and then it drops down drastically to below 20%. So it, you know, the chess and STEM gender debates are very similar, which is why I actually have projects on both of these uh, sides of things. But just how it relates to the fighting chess index, one of the arguments put forward for differences in both STEM and in chess is competitiveness. We know that boys are more competitive than girls, and there's actually a lot of research to show that there are biological reasons for this, you know, evolutionary reasons for why this might be the case. And if these are fields where being competitive uh, helps you to train harder, fight better, uh, and just generally stay in the sport for longer, then that could explain some of the differences. We know there are gender differences in this particular behavioral trait. Maybe that explains some of the gap that we find at the elite levels. However, in STEM, they haven't done this research in chess. In STEM, what they found is that, well, actually, the girls who keep going in STEM are the really competitive ones. So that by the time you look at just the professionals in STEM, yeah, it's true we have a lower number of women than men, but if we measure their competitiveness, we're not seeing gender differences anymore. You'll see it in mm. other professions outside of STEM, but women in STEM are not less competitive than men in STEM. So we've got to look at other factors at that point. We're already getting the competitive ones self-selecting into it. And I thought to myself in chess, we might even find that being even more the case that the girls who stay in the chess world, which has a very low number, obviously, of, of, of other women players, may turn out to be the, the even more competitive ones. So we might find, on average, more competitive girls than boys. Now, this hasn't been measured in the traditional way that you measure competitiveness using these well-established tools now in behavioral economics. But we can look at the fighting chess index. We can look at draw offers. We can look at how long you play the game and stuff like this. And what we find is that women, on average, have higher fighting chess index scores than men. Now, it's nothing conclusive. It's not directly comparable to STEM or other fields, but it is kind of consistent with the idea that um, the women we have in the chess world are very competitive by their nature and maybe even to the point where they are more competitive than the average male. Hmm. That's interesting. And is this, um, I, I believe you've published a paper on this, correct? Is that correct? Uh, I published some stuff uh, related to a stereotype threat in the chess world. <clears throat> so uh, this is this was particularly a rebuttal to another paper which which uh, talked about that there wasn't any stereotype problems. Stereotype threat is one of those behavioral aspects um, in in social psychology that is controversial, is debated. But this is the idea that say you're a, you're a girl, you go into a field where you don't see other girls at the top. You don't see women at the top and you see low number of women in there. Somehow that filters through to your perception about whether or not you should continue in this, in this field or even can affect your performance over the board. So the, the, the famous examples of stereotype threat involve girls being told before they do a math exam, by the way, typically girls don't score very well in this exam. Uh, and what you'll see is the girls who are told this do much worse in their test than the girls who aren't told this. And you see the same thing with African-Americans and, and other groups that are historically disadvantaged. Now, it is a controversial literature, but what I tried to show in chess is that in general, um, girls seem to play worse when they play against a boy than when they play against a girl, regardless of the elo of the opponent. But there are, it's very complicated in chess because it's not just like doing a test where it's your performance on a test. 
your opponent's behavior matters as well. So it could be that men are playing differently against women. And here's the interesting question for you. Imagine you, Ben, a man, you're playing against an opponent and you're playing against a 2200 man or you're playing against a 2200 woman. Would you change your behavior at all at the board? Would you change your style? Would you change anything compared, depending on their gender, knowing that they have exactly the same rating? Yeah, I'd be more likely to discriminate on age. <laughs> on age? <laughs> the yeah. age no, that's a very good point because we know that ELO ratings are less reliable in a predictable direction depending on their age. So a 2,200 9-year-old and a 2,200 90-year-old, <laughs> they're right. different strength. But here I'm talking about 20... Uh, so in all of my analyses, I control for age as a factor. It's really good that you bring that up because many other um, papers that have been put out or, or bad analyses, bad takes, don't do that. So it's really good that you mention that. But okay, let's make it simple. You're playing against 25-year-old Same man, 25-year-old. Yeah. No, I, w- I wouldn't. You wouldn't, yeah. So yeah. here's the thing. You wouldn't consciously. For sure you wouldn't right. consciously. I should have said consciously, yeah. yeah and, and the chess world is... A relatively accepting place to women, I believe, with you know the couple of odd exceptions like this this incident yesterday. But in general, I think that the the chess culture towards women is not bad. Everything can be improved, of course, but it's not bad. It's reasonably welcoming. But at a subconscious level, and also not just at a subconscious level, but at some societal structural level, there are things that maybe we can improve. Now, at the subconscious level, it's been shown that if you're losing against your uh, your, your, what did I say? 2200 female yeah. opponent, you're going to play on for longer. You're not going to resign as early than if you, you're playing against huh. your 2200 man opponent. It's, you know, same position, you're losing by the same amount, they got the same rating, but you'll play on for longer. You'll also, on average, play slightly riskier against your, your woman opponent than against your man opponent, even though they've got the same rating. So men change their behavior in, in slight ways. Subconscious ways, unlikely to be doing this on purpose, depending on when they're playing against women. And women also modify their behavior and their performance when they're playing against men. So there are things going on here that are not, uh, that are not biologically based. Now, I, like I said, I try to stay objective in my research. So I'm not saying that there aren't biological differences. There can be biological differences. There's evidence that there are some biological differences. But I'm not really interested in that side of things. People often say, do you think a woman could become world champion? And I say, I don't care. That's not the, that's not the question that I'm interested in. I'm interested in if, say that the natural rate of women grandmasters is, say it's only 20%. Maybe that's what the natural rate is. I don't care. But if that's what the natural rate is and our current rate is 2%, then that's a lot that can be done. Right? There's, right, there's a lot still in place at the moment. And um, one of these um, surveys that I did in the past, I, I did a, another big survey. Where I looked at top men and women chess players. I looked at their their life cycles, their training patterns, things like marriage, things like giving birth, things like all these sort of things. One of the big things that came out of it is that for girls, talented girl players, it gets quite lonely at some point once you yeah. move beyond girls classes you get to a point where it's you and all the boys and it can be hard for your your training to always be training by yourself to always be practicing by yourself always be going to tournaments by yourself that can be really difficult and that's not a a biological difference that's a problem that we have with participation and and social structures and we have policies that we can do to fix that and i mentioned this a few times so this year is the Fide year of women in chess, uh, you, you might be aware, and uh, mm-hmm. or you may not be aware because not a lot has been done so far. Yeah, no, I was aware. <laughs> <laughs> not a lot has been done so far, but there have been one of the things that Fide's done is it's had um, every couple of months it's had like a big online conference or, or seminar where it's been discussing these issues. And I, I talked at one of these, and I'll, I'll talk at another. And I've put forward a couple of different suggestions, like low hanging fruit suggestions that I think can try to close the gap that exists that shouldn't exist like the the to the extent that a gap exists between men and women in chess that we can fix particularly say girls dropping out at the age of 18 for different reasons what are what are things that we can do and one of the things i think is to really focus on these behavioral um these behavioral theories around stereotypes uh role models and peer effects now these all sound like very fluffy terms for an economist to be 
throwing around, but basically the idea is, well, we have all these talented girls around the world. Chess is a global game, but they just don't see each other. They all feel like they're the only one in a man's sport. If we can find ways to get them together, have these sort of girls camps. I wanted, I wanted FIDE to organize a girls in chess camp every year where they get all together with strong female role models at all levels of the chess world. So not just strong players, but also arbiters, officials, people on, on the board, these sort of things. Um, we know from lots of research in STEM and in other fields that this makes a big difference for the likelihood that these girls will continue going in the chess world. And that's what we need to do. We know that in the chess world, it's a, we have a, we have a, a problem that's not a pipeline problem. We don't start at a very, very low base level with girl players. We start at actually a pretty high base level at 30%. And at some point we get down to 2% at grandmaster level, right? So we've got this issue that uh, we've got to keep girls in chess somehow. And we've got the research and tools to be able to do that. Sorry, I know that I just went on a massive monologue, but that's no, <laughs> something no, that I care important. a lot about at the moment. Yeah, yeah. no, it's, it's um, good to get your perspective on it. Um, and, and as you say, topical, unfortunately, <laughs> today. Um, so I think that, um, I mean, it's it's fascinating, and I'd love to catch up again at some point. I know you said you have another paper uh, that, that might be coming out next year, chess-related. Yeah, yeah. Look, uh, I'm, I'm, I got teased the other day by one of my colleagues that I'm becoming the world's foremost chess economist. <laughs> uh, in uh, I think it's like a it's a pool of one, so it's probably right. just me, right? But uh, but yeah, you know, I, like I'm interested in anything that involves the chess world, but is also interesting to policymakers in in non chess fields, whether that be gender, whether it be dishonesty. One that I got interested in recently was to do with um, the effect of wearing face masks on cognitive performance. Um, we talk a lot about wearing face masks and when a face mask policy is good and bad. With the spread of, of COVID, it's something that countries around the world are kind of grappling with. In, in the past, we haven't spoken much about potential costs of wearing face masks besides things like freedom or whatever else, you know, but like like specific costs of wearing face masks. And for good reason, because we, we wanted to try to stop the spread as quickly and rapidly as possible uh, of, of uh, COVID. And that was priority number one. But I thought it would be interesting to think about, well, uh, what if you're engaging in a strenuous and difficult cognitive activity for some period of time? It could be in your work, in your profession. It could be sitting an exam. Are there any effects of, of wearing masks? Maybe there are none. Maybe there are small ones and they go away. Maybe there are large ones. Like nobody knows. And it's very difficult to get data to analyze that stuff. Uh, and chess, again, just like in these other cases, just happens to be the perfect environment to study this stuff because we've got the same players sometimes having to wear a mask and sometimes not having to wear a mask in their games. We can compare their moves to engine evaluations. We can track them across time. And we've got literally millions of, of data points. So uh, it's a pretty exciting project I've been working on for a bit. Uh, unfortunately, I've got to disappoint you by saying that because it's going through its last round of revisions at a journal, I, I don't want to tell you too much about it yet. But hopefully we can chat soon if you're interested. Sure. Yeah. No, it's a cliffhanger. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this we'll, uh, is how I uh, I have to speak to and get you to invite me back, you know. Just excellent. Well, I, I'd be happy to. Yeah, David. And as I've said before, you're you're one of these people. I, I don't know how you do it. I mean, I didn't even mention in the intro you're a dad and a husband. I don't know how you put out that chess book on top of all this stuff, but uh, but we do appreciate all of your efforts on uh, on behalf of the chess world in particular. Well, likewise, Ben. I mean, you're another person whose service to the chess community. Deserves more credit. So now on your podcast, to listeners who already know how great you are, I'll say again, <laughs> thank you for your work. Oh, my pleasure. All right. Thanks a lot, David. Um, keep uh, keep sharing your occasional thoughts online on this um, uh, unfortunate, never-ending controversy. <laughs> thanks, Ben. Cheers. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. Big shout out to my producer, Matthew Passy. I'd also like to thank the Blue Wire Podcast Network, with whom we are proud to be affiliated. Be sure to follow us on social media, Beneficial1 on Twitter, at Perpetual Chess on Instagram, and or you can join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group. You can email me, ben at perpetualchesspod.com. And of course, last but not least, I'd like to give 
Major thanks to the Perpetual Chess Patreon and PayPal supporters. Those who choose to join that community based on their level of support can do things like submit questions for guests of the show, have access to live Zoom Q&A lectures with grandmasters who often have appeared on the show, going over chess games, answering questions, stuff like that. And you can even get access to ad-free Perpetual Chess if that's your preference. So, but most of all, thanks to everyone for listening and we will catch you all on the next episode.